Okay, uh, welcome everybody to the afternoon session. Um, are we all ready to start again? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so the first talk is by Alberto El Duque about uh, composition algebras. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers of the school for uh, this opportunity. It's a real pleasure to uh, give these lectures in this school. And uh, well, uh, this is a course on composition algebra. But uh, today I will just review, today it will be a bit special. I will just review classical things and a little bit of history about uh, the most important composition algebra that are quaternion and octonions. Uh, already in the first talk, Alan Chapman told about uh, these algebras. So I will repeat a few things that appear on already in the first talk, but I hope you uh, th there will be uh, more material and uh, some reasons why it is important to study uh, composition algebra in general. So the idea is uh, to start with this kind of historical motivation and uh, starting tomorrow, we will deal with formal definitions and theorems and things like that. So anyway, today we are going just to talk about quaternions and octonions, and we are going to start with simple things, just with real and complex numbers, then we'll move to quaternions. Then we will see how quaternions are very useful in dealing with rotations in three-dimensional space in a very precise way, and not only in three-dimensional space, only also in four-dimensional space. And finally, we'll move uh, to octonions, how to pass from quaternions to octonions. So everything starts with real and complex numbers, and well, you know what real numbers are, and we can uh, uh, consider the real line where we have the natural numbers, the neutral element, zero, we move in the opposite direction. We have the negative numbers. Uh, we have all fractional numbers in the real line, some algebraic numbers like square roots or things like that, and uh, nice transcendental numbers like e, pi, and all these kind of things. But you all know that uh, with real numbers, we cannot solve easy equations like x squared plus one equals zero. So we have to move forward and add some imaginary numbers and deal with complex numbers. So we can think of complex numbers as pairs of real numbers. So we can identify the complex numbers with the Euclidean plane over the real numbers. So we have all these numbers, a plus bi. And, uh, what we impose is that i squared is minus one, but other than that, the multiplication is the natural one. So we use the distributivity property and, and uh, all the usual properties, plus the uh, fact that i squared is going to be minus one. And that's all. With this, we get this multiplication and essentially, this is the same formula that has appeared before in Alan Chapman's uh, talk and will appear later. Later on, we'll have to be careful with the order of the factors that appear here. But uh, moving from the real numbers to complex numbers uh, consists of doubling the field of real numbers with an imaginary unit and then taking care of the, of the multiplication. Uh, one interesting property is that the norm of the product is the product of the corresponding norms. Well, the norm is just the, the usual length in the Euclidean plane. Okay, so the, the length of the product of two complex numbers is the product of the corresponding lengths. And this has some nice uh, consequences. So for instance, the rotation of angle alpha in the Euclidean plane corresponds to multiplication by this complex number of length one and argument alpha, okay? Whenever we multiply by this complex number, the length is one, so the length uh, 
is invariant. So we get an isometry of the Euclidean plane. And actually this isometry is just the rotation of angle alpha. So in other words, we can identify the special orthogonal group in dimension two with the set of complex numbers of length one. But the complex numbers of length one is just the unit circle in the Euclidean plane. So here we have an algebraic object, the special orthogonal group of, of the Euclidean plane. And here we have a geometric object, the unit circle in the Euclidean plane, and they are related in this way. Okay, this is well known, so I will not insist on that. So let's move to quaternions. Let's move with the history of the discovery of the quaternions. Because the, the idea, because of these nice geometrical properties of complex numbers, the idea of Hamilton was to find a three-dimensional algebra in order to deal with the geometry of the Euclidean three-dimensional space in terms of this three-dimensional algebra. So Hamilton tried to find a unital three-dimensional algebra over the real numbers, and he wanted to keep this uh, property of the nice property uh, of the length, the, the, that the length of the product of two numbers in our new system should be the product of the corresponding lengths. So this he called the law of model. So he tried. And he tried and what, what he did was, okay, we have already the first two dimensions, a plus bi, and he added a new imaginary unit, J, and decided that this would be an imaginary unit exactly as I. So J squared should be minus one. And then the question is how to multiply these elements. And of course, the, the product is, okay, we know that I squared is minus one. We have imposed that J squared is minus one too. Now the question is what uh, IJ and JI look like. So this was the problem. And he tried for years. He tried for many years. And he collected uh, his memories about all these things. And finally, he found the solution on October 16th, uh, 1843. So uh, he recalled this, uh, these things. He collected his memories about this period in a letter uh, to his old son, uh, Archibald Hamilton, and this is a letter in, of 1865, and this is the year he passed away. So this letter was written a few weeks before he passed away. And he organized the letter in four paragraphs. And in the first paragraph, he told about, uh, what he wanted to talk about the quaternions and, uh, and these kind of things. And uh, in the second paragraph, he mentioned that the problem is, well, what is the multiplication of these quaternions? And also what is the utility of these quaternions? They can be defined. But initially he didn't want to define a quaternion algebra, but just a three-dimensional algebra. Okay, then in the third paragraph, uh, he uh, talks about the anti-quaternionic time here. Yeah. And, uh, and mentioned the year, October 1843. And well, he recalls the, the, the moment that he realized how to do it. And, and uh, this is a part that I like very much, very much. He says, every morning in the early part of, the, of this month, October uh, 1843, on my coming down to breakfast, your then little brother, William Edwin, and yourself used to ask me, well, Papa, can you multiply triples? And he had to reply, no, I can only add and subtract. Them. So he had just these three-dimensional objects, three-dimensional vectors, and he knew how to add and multiply by scalars, but he didn't know how to define a multiplication of these triples to get some, something interesting. 
to, to preserve this law of Google. And in the fourth paragraph, he remembers the day, the 16th of October, and this was a council day of the Iris, uh, Royal Iris Academy, and he was walking with his wife uh, through the canal, and this is how he described the feeling he had when he realized how to proceed. He says, an electric circuit seemed to close, the spark flashed forth, and continues like, like this. So he remembers very well the moment where he suddenly realized how to deal with uh, the problem he had in, in mind. And in the same fourth paragraph, he says that, well, that he couldn't resist the impulse to ride with a knife in the, in the bridge, in the stone of the, of the bridge, the equations that define uh, the new algorithm. So, and, and he introduces a new imaginary unit, K, and the fact that I times J has to be equal to K, so that this equation holds. So everything is summarized in these uh, equalities, and this is the solution of the problem. So he went to the meeting of the Iris Academy and already asked to, to talk about uh, his new discovery in the next session that was uh, scheduled for November 13. And uh, well, he distributed the letter in four paragraphs. So he finished the letter with, with this quaternion of paragraphs, I closed this letter and so on. Well, this first letter, letter one, uh, but uh, so his intention was to continue with a second letter. Okay, so in this letter, he recalls uh, his memories of the discovery of the quaternion. So what is going on in this letter? By, by the way, this bridge exists. The, of course, the inscription of Hamilton has disappeared a uh, long time ago. Uh, the name of the bridge is not exactly uh, Hamilton recovered, recall the, the name uh, in a wrong way, this Broom Bridge. And each October 16, uh, mathematics students of the University of Dublin go to this bridge to pay tribute to the discovery of the quaternions. So if you go to Dublin, you should visit this bridge. Okay, what is going on? Uh, Hamilton, in principle, tried to uh, define a product in the three-dimensional algebra spanned by one i and j. And then he realized that the problem was to define the product of i times j and j times i. And he realized that the product of i times j has to be a different thing, has to be something independent of one i and j. So he defined i times j equals k, and k was another imaginary unit. And then he completed the product necessary to, to define this algebra. So in particular, this algebra is no longer commutative because he was forced to define j times i as minus k instead of as k. And then one defines i times j equals k and proceeds cyclically, j, j times k equals i and so on. And then use this kind of anti-commutativity, partial anti-commutativity to define the product in this algebra. Here is a stamp uh, of uh, the 20th century of Ireland where, well, they missed uh, part of the, uh, uh, inscription that uh, Hamilton did in the, in the bridge with the knife. So it is missing IJK. But uh, quaternions were very important. And uh, uh, for a long time, uh, they were, uh, there was a whole school in Ireland of uh, mathematicians studying properties of the, of the quaternions. OK, so let's go to some properties of the algebra of quaternions. And the first property is that, well, this was the intention of Hamilton. Hamilton, in principle, wanted to define a three-dimensional algebra with a product such that the length of the product, the length is the Euclidean length in three-dimensional space, or in this case, in four-dimensional space. So his idea was to define an algebra so that the length of the product is the product of the length. 
the corresponding units. Uh, so using the usual Euclidean norm in four-dimensional space, well, and with this four-dimensional algebra, we have that this law of moduli uh, is valid. The length of the product is the product of the length. So this is the important property that he wanted to keep from complex numbers when extending complex numbers. And because of that, if you take a non-zero quaternion, so a non-zero expression of this four, a plus bi plus cj plus dk, if you take a non-zero element, because of this, uh, uh, this non-zero element is not a zero device. So whenever uh, you take non-zero elements, uh, the multiplication either on the left or on the right is a uh, bijection. So this is an associative division algebra. It's an associative algebra and any non-zero element actually is invertible and all follows from the first property, but it is not commuted. So we lose commutativity when we move from complex numbers to uh, Hamilton quaternions. And also exactly as for complex numbers, in complex numbers, the, the unit length complex numbers for the unit circle, well, here we are in the four dimensional space. So the unit length elements for the three dimensional sphere. So the three dimensional sphere, this geometrical object lives naturally inside the quaternions as the set of quaternions of length one. But when we multiply two quaternions of length one, because of the nice multiplicative, multiplicativity property of the, of the length, uh, when you multiply two quaternions of length one, you get a quaternion of length one. So the product of two length one quaternions, so the product of two elements in this three-dimensional sphere is again in this three-dimensional sphere. So we have endowed the three-dimensional sphere with an associative multiplication where all the elements are invertible and we have a unity, one. Uh, so this is a group. So this geometrical object, exactly as for complex numbers, is a group, actually a Lie group. In particular, this implies the parallelizability of the three-dimensional sphere. So this is quite nice. Also, inside the quaternions, we have the imaginary part and the imaginary part is a three-dimensional Euclidean space. So we have a three-dimensional space over the real numbers with the usual length. So this is the three-dimensional Euclidean space. And the algebra of quaternions splits as the real part, the, the scalar multiples of the unity, plus the imaginary part. So we have a direct sum. And whenever we multiply two elements in the imaginary part, uh, the product has a scalar part and, a, and an imaginary part. And the scalar part is just up to the sign, just the usual scalar product of two vectors in three-dimensional Euclidean space. And the imaginary part is just the usual cross product of vectors in three-dimensional space. So inside the quaternions, when we multiply imaginary vectors, vectors in three-dimensional space inside the quaternions, the multiplication is given by using both the scalar and cross product in three-dimensional uh, Euclidean space. So all this is very nice. And uh, well, exactly as for complex numbers, well, the complex numbers form uh, degree two field extension of the real numbers. So in particular, any complex number has, uh, well, is a root of a degree two equation. Well, the same happens with uh, quaternions. So if we take any quaternion with the real part and the imaginary part, then if you take the square, well, uh, multiply using the above properties, and you get that the square of the quaternion minus this real number, twice the real part times the quaternion plus the square of the length is zero. So any quaternion is a root of this degree two equation, the Kiley Hamilton equation in the quaternions. Exactly as uh, the, what happened for complex numbers. Also, we have an evolution, this is important. 
So uh, we just keep the real part and change sign in the imaginary part. And then when we add a quaternion and it's conjugate, we get just twice the real part. This is the trace, the quaternion. And when we multiply a quaternion by its conjugate in any order, what we get is the square of the length of the, of the quaternion. Also, uh, inside the quaternions, we have the complex numbers. And what Hamilton did to define the quaternions was, okay, we have the complex numbers. We add the imaginary unit J, but if I add J, I have to add also I times J. So I have to add all the multiples of J by scalar, by complex numbers. So actually the quaternions appears as two copies of the complex numbers. We have the span of one and I, it's a copy of the complex numbers, and we add another copy labeled by J. So we add J, but we have to add all the multiples of J by uh, complex numbers. So actually what we have is a two-dimensional vector space over the complex numbers. And when we think of the quaternions as a two-dimensional vector space over the complex numbers, the multiplication, this is the formula for the multiplication, always, which is essentially the same as the formula to multiply complex numbers starting with real numbers. The only problem is that we have to use the conjugation, the involution that we have, and we have to be a bit careful with, with that. But essentially, this is the same form. In the real numbers, we have uh, the involution that we have is the trivial one. So if we forget about this involution, the formula that we have is exactly the one that we have to define complex numbers starting from real numbers. Okay, so let's move to some applications of, to, of the quaternions. And these are applications that are used nowadays. Uh, so uh, uh, a few months ago, I uh, attended a lecture by some astronomer and he was using quaternions to uh, compose rotations in three-dimensional space in the way I'm going to, to explain to you. But also people in robotics use quaternions to compose rotations in three-dimensional space. So let me show you how this is done. So, okay, start with a length one quaternion, Q. So uh, since uh, the length is one, the real part lies between minus one and one. So you can fix an angle alpha between zero and pi so that the real part is cosine of alpha, this angle. And then you can choose the direction that appears in the imaginary part. So you can fix an imaginary quaternion of length one. And then since the length of Q is one, this quaternion uh, is of this form. Cosine of alpha times one plus sine of alpha times the corresponding direction in the imaginary part. Okay, so any quaternion can be written in this for some unit length uh, quaternion of uh, without real part, some unit length imaginary quaternion and some angle between zero and five. Okay, now take an orthogonal imaginary unit, orthogonal to U. So we take another imaginary quaternion of length one orthogonal to U and we complete to an orthonormal basis of the imaginary part, which is the Euclidean space of dimension three. So you take uv and u cross v to get a positively, positively oriented orthonormal basis of the Euclidean space. And now consider conjugation by q, uh, but restricted to imaginary quaternions. So we take this, our three-dimensional Euclidean space, and we just conjugate any element in this space by Q. So we take X and this goes to Q, X, Q minus one, or Q minus one because of the length being one, 
q minus one is the same as q bar, the evolution. Okay, so let's see what kind of linear map is this. And let's do it in a very, let's say, pedestrian. So let's see what happens to the vectors in our orthonormal oriented basis. So we start with u. And this is easy. u is a linear combination of the unity and u. And both the unity and u commute with u. So the element Q commutes with U. So we conjugate U by Q, we get U. So this is a fixed vector. Okay, let's go to see what happens with V. So we take the image of V, and by definition, this is Q, which is this vector, this quaternion, times V times the inverse, which is the same as the conjugate by the involution. So we just change this up. Now we multiply. When we multiply u times v, well, we have the scalar product, which is zero because u and v are orthogonal, and the cross product. So this is what we get when we multiply the first two quaternions that appear here. Now we must multiply by the conjugate of Q, and you apply all the properties you know of the uh, cross product, and apply all these properties, and you get cosine square of alpha minus sine square of alpha, apply, uh, multiplied by V, and then the scalar of U cross V is twice cosine of alpha sine of alpha. So just using the trigonometrical formulas that you all know, what we get is cosine of two alpha times V plus sine of two alpha U cross V. And you apply the same thing uh, with the image of the third vector in our orthonormal basis. You multiply, use the properties of the cross product and so on. And this is what you get. So if we think in terms of matrices, this is the matrix you get. Now here you will see that this is a rotation of angle two alpha fixing U, so around the axis given by U. So conjugation by unit length quaternions are rotations in three-dimensional space. Well, again, we identify the three-dimensional Euclidean space with the imaginary part of the quaternions. So this can be put in a fancier way, a more interesting way, probably, which is as follows. We take unit length quaternions, and some before, this can be identified with a three-dimensional sphere. And to each unit length quaternion, we assign the conjugation by Q. The conjugation by Q is a rotation, as we have seen. So it's an element of the special orthogonal group in dimension three. But any rotation has a coordinate matrix like the previous one. So this is surjective, actually. So, so this is surjective, and it is therefore a surjective group homomorphism. This is a group, the special orthogonal group, and this is also a group, this geometric object, also a group because it lives inside the quaternions and it inherits the multiplication in the quaternions. Actually, it's a Lie group homomorphism. And the kernel is quite easy to check. The kernel consists of the quaternions Q such that conjugation by Q is the identity map. But the conjugation by Q is the identity map if Q commutes with all quaternions. And the only quaternions that commute with all other quaternions are the scalar ones. And the scalar quaternions of length one are one and minus one. So the kernel consists of just one and minus one. So we have that the special orthogonal group is the quotient of the three dimensional sphere, which is a Lie group, modulo the center of this three dimensional sphere, which consists of just one and minus one. Actually, the 
three dimensional sphere, <coughs> simply connected, and it is the universal cover of the Lie group consisting of the compact Lie group of a special orthogonal, uh, the special orthogonal group in dimension three. Okay, so this is quite nice. And the interesting thing is that what we have seen is that rotations in three dimensional sp uh, space is, are conjugations by norm one quaternions. The only thing is that we have this modulo plus or minus one. So the same rotation is given by two different quaternions, a quaternion Q and minus Q. Uh, but the, the important thing of all this is that now it is quite easy to compose rotations in three-dimensional space. Once we have a rotation, we can pick, we have two possibilities, but we can pick a norm one quaternion given this rotation by conjugation. And if you have another rotation, you have another quaternion, and then how to compose these two rotations? Multiplying the quaternions. So the, the composition is given by the rotation attached to the product of these two quaternions, because this is a group homomorphism. That's it. Okay, so it is enough to multiply not one quaternions. So, and this is much quicker than just multiplying matrices, the matrices, the coordinate matrices of the rotations. So just thinking about the, the right quaternion, give us all the information. Give us the axis of rotation, give us the angle of rotation, and give us the way to compose rotation. Actually, there were formulas to compose rotation by Olinde Rodriguez in 1840. Quaternions appeared in 1843. So these formulas were earlier and in terms of the axis and the angle, and well, the formulas that one gets with quaternions coincide with these formulas by Olinde Rodriguez. But thinking in terms of quaternions, it's very, very easy to uh, compose rotation and to deal with rotation. That's why quaternions are important in robotics, where one has the arm of a robot, one has to compose different rotations, or in astronomy, um, with uh, satellites and all these kind of things. Okay. But uh, there is more than just rotation in three dimensional space. Let's move to rotations in four dimensional Euclidean space. So again, we take a length one quaternion, quaternion of norm one. And we consider left or right multiplication by this element. Because the norm of the product is the product of the norms, the left or right multiplication, exactly as for complex numbers, are isometries. So we have isometries given by the left or right multiplication by any unit length quaternion. Okay, we know that these quaternions can be written in this way. When we fix the direction in the imaginary part, this quaternion P, we know that this quaternion satisfies a degree two equation. And this degree two equation is an irreducible real polynomial of degree two, uh, unless P equals one or minus one. So, with these two exceptions, one or minus one, this degree to equation gives the minimal polynomial of these isometries, the multiplication on the left or on the right by the quaternion P. So we have the minimal polynomial and therefore, and, and it is reducible, so it is uh, very easy to compute the, the characteristic polynomial. The characteristic polynomial is always the square of this, even for one or minus one, so this happens. Uh, always. And well, this is the characteristic polynomial. So in particular, the determinant of the multiplication by P, both on the left or on the right is one. So left on right multiplication, multiplications by unit length quaternions are isometries of determinant one. So they belong to the special orthogonal group in dimension four. Okay. So, What we have is that multiplication by norm one quaternions are rotations, are elements of the special orthogonal. So let's see how to deal with rotations in four-dimensional space. We have a rotation in the four-dimensional Euclidean space, 
and we identify this space with the space of quaternions, well, we just take the image of the unit of one. And the image of one is a unit length quaternion, A. Okay, so now if we multiply by the inverse of A, and since the norm is one, the inverse is obtained just by applying the conjugation. So if we take one, apply, get the image of one by our rotation, we get A. And then we multiply by the inverse of A, we get one. So composing our rotation psi by the left multiplication by A bar, which is also rotation in four dimensional space, we get a rotation that fixes the element one. And if it fixes the element one, it fixes the orthogonal complement to one, which consists of the imaginary quaternions. So the composition of our original rotation and the left multiplication by a bar is actually a rotation in the three-dimensional Euclidean space given by the imaginary quaternions. But we know what the rotations in this space look like. They are conjugations by unit length quaternions. So there exists a norm one quaternion Q such that this conjugation, that this composition of psi and left multiplication by a bar is just conjugation by Q. Now we multiply on both, side, on both sides of this equation by A and we get that psi of X equals AQ times X times Q minus one. So any rotation in four dimensional space is obtained by multiplying by unit length quaternion on the left and then multiplying by another unit length quaternion on the right, okay? So if you, one you can denote AQ by P and what we have is that psi of X is P X Q minus one with P and Q unit length quaternion. And this is what happens. So starting with any two unit length quaternions, P and Q, we can consider the map that takes any quaternion X to the product P X Q minus one. And this is a rotation in four dimensional space, identifying this four dimensional space with the quaternion. And any rotation as, as we have just seen comes in this way. So again, this is a map that it is surjective. It's quite easy to check that this is a group homomorphism. Actually, it is a homomorphism of Lie groups because we have Lie groups on both sides, the compact Lie group given by the special orthogonal group in dimension four on the right and the Cartesian product of two copies of the three dimensional sphere on the left. And this is a group homomorphism and again, Computing the kernel is quite easy. If uh, we take P and Q such that psi of PQ is the identity map, it means that PX equals XQ for any X. In particular, with X equals one, you get that P equals Q. So the two elements must be equal. And because of the kernel, the computation of the previous kernel, they must be either one or minus one. So the kernel is the cyclic group of order two uh, generated by minus one minus one, the, this kernel, this kernel. So in fancier terms, what we get is that the special orthogonal group in dimension four uh, is the quotient of uh, the Cartesian product of two copies of the three dimensional sphere by the kernel, which is a cyclic group of order two. Uh, th this is not the whole center, of this group. So if we divide by the center on both sides, what we get is that SO3 cross SO3, two copies of the special orthogonal group of dimension three, is just the quotient of the special orthogonal group in dimension four modulo the center, which is the projected special orthogonal group. And well, if one moves to Lie algebras, here you have an explanation why the simple Lie algebra of type D2 is the same as two copies of A1, if you know, if you know what I mean by this. So the, all this comes in uh, 
low dimension because of the of the quaternions. Okay. So again, it is quite easy to compose rotations in four dimensional space because it is enough to multiply pairs of unit length quaternions. Now an exercise for all of you. What kind of rotation is this psi of PQ, assuming that uh, for the unit length quaternion P, the corresponding angle is alpha and beta corresponds to Q. I'm going to give you the solution. We are in dimension four. So rotations, maybe uh, double rotations with respect to two uh, axes in different two dimensional orthogonal subspaces. Well, this is a double rotation with angles alpha plus beta and alpha minus beta. This is what happens. Okay, so this is about quaternions. So let's move in the last minutes to octonions. So we have started with the real numbers and uh, doubling the real numbers, we have obtained the complex numbers. Doubling the complex numbers, although the initial idea of Hamilton was not this because he wanted to find a three-dimensional algebra, but he realized that he had to double complex numbers and go to four-dimensional algebra, the algebra of quaternions. So again, what happens if we continue? And actually this idea uh, was an idea of a good friend of Hamilton, uh, John Graves. So see, the discovery of quaternions is, uh, happens in October, 16th, and immediately Hamilton goes to the meeting of the IDs, uh, Royal IDs Academy and already uh, asked to talk about this discovery in the next meeting, but already announced everyone that he has discovered a new algebra with nice properties and, and so on. And it seems that he explains a little bit how this works. And uh, this mathematician, John Graves is there. And only 10 days later, he writes a letter to Hamilton with this. There is still something in the system which gravels me. Having yet any clear views as to the extent to which we are at liberty arbitrarily to create imaginaries and to endow them with supernatural properties. And he finishes with this. If with your alchemy, you can make three pounds of gold, why should you stop there? So, if doubling the real numbers, we get the complex numbers. If doubling the complex numbers, one gets quaternions. Why should we stop there? And this is an idea of Graves only 10 days after the discovery of the quaternions. And he started immediately to work on this idea. So now things are easy. We started with complex numbers and we added a new imaginary unit, J. But if we add a J, we have to add also any complex number multiplied by J. So we have to add J and I times J and all the linear combination. Well, now we add a new imaginary unit. Let's call this imaginary unit L. And if we add L, we must add I times L, J times L, and K times L. And we get something of dimension eight. And one has to be a bit careful with the uh, multiplication because the important thing is to preserve the multiplicative property of the norm. Okay. And I put here the figure of a uh, photograph of Arthur Cayley because Graves had the idea in 1843. And he wrote to Hamilton about this idea. He expanded his idea and wrote a paper on octonions by December, 1843. And he sent this paper to Hamilton, who was an editor of an Irish mathematical journal. But, well, Hamilton put this paper aside. Okay, I will have a look at it. And it took time and time, and he was looking at the development of quaternions and some other things. So it took more than one year for Hamilton as an editor to deal with the paper by Graves. And in the meantime, Arthur Cayley had the same idea and published it. And the paper by Cayley appeared a few months earlier than the paper, paper by Graves. 
And that's why we talk about octonions or Cayley algebras, even though it was clear from this correspondence with Hamilton that Graves had the idea as early as December uh, 1843. Okay. So what are the octonions? Well, we add this new imaginary unit L and we have to add all quaternion multiples of L. So we have to add I times L, J times L, and K times L. And we have to use this multiplication and exactly this multiplication. Tomorrow we will see why this is the only possible multiplication. Okay, so we will develop everything and in more generality than just for real algebras over arbitrary fields, even characteristic. And here we have to be careful about the order because now P1, Q1, P2, and Q2 are quaternions. So the multiplication of quaternions is not commutative. So it has to be very careful about the order here, 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 and here. And one has also to be careful about the involution, where to put the involution is in exactly the same places are for quaternions coming from complex numbers. But now the order is quite important because the multiplication of quaternions is not commutative, so one has to use exactly this order. So this is the algebra of quaternions, and with exactly this multiplication, so both Graves and Kiley had to try with different combinations of order here, and only this combination works nicely to preserve the, the norm, so that the norm is again multiplicative. The norm is the Euclidean norm in eight dimensional space, identifying the octonions with a dimensional space with this orthonormal basis. Okay, so again, we get the Euclidean norm in eight dimensional space. And again, these are the same forms that move to, are used to pass from complex numbers to quaternions. Okay, now properties. Well, the first property is the property everyone was looking for when making this extension, both Graves and Cayley, that the, the norm should be multiplicative. The length of the product should be the product of the lengths, because this is the crucial identity. And this is what uh, allows us to deal with rotations, because left and right multiplications are isometries because of this problem. Again, exactly with the Quaternions, as for the quaternions, the octonions for a division algebra. But moving from complex numbers to quaternions, we lose commutativity. The product is no longer commutative. Now we lose associativity. So the product of octonions is no longer associative. But it is not very far from being associative. It is what is called alternative, and alternative algebras are algebras where any two elements generate an associative swatch. Of course, octonions are not generated by two elements, they are generated by A, J, and L. Okay, so, uh, and these are not associative, but they are quite close. As long as we work in a subalgebra generated by two elements, this subalgebra is associative. And actually, these are the only finite dimensional real alternative division algebras, real numbers, complex numbers, quaternions, and octonions. If we forget about, the, this was proved by Thorne in 1933, if we forget about the octonions, we get the only finite dimensional real associative division algebras, the, the real numbers, complex numbers, and quaternions. This was much easier and was proved earlier by Frobenius in 19th century. Now, with quaternions, we have the, the inside the quaternions, we have the three dimensional sphere. And this was a Lie group because of the multiplicative property of the, of the norm. Well, the same. If we take the unit length octonions, we have the seven dimensional sphere inside the octonions. But this is no longer a group because the product is not associated. But anyway, it, uh, this is uh, perhaps the most important example of what are called MUFAN groups. Okay. Again, as for the quaternions. If we, take, if we take just the imaginary quaternions, this is the seven dimensional Euclidean space. And whenever we took two elements here and we multiply them, U and V, it has a scalar part. 
which is minus the usual scalar product, and an imaginary part, which is the cross product in seven dimensional space. There is a cross product in three dimensional space, a cross product in seven dimensional space with the same properties. And these are the only po two possible dimensions, three and seven for this cross product. So the cross product in seven dimensional space appear uh, with the octonions. And also any octonion satisfies a degree two equation exactly as for complex numbers and uh, whatever. What about geometric properties? Well, now the universal covers of the special orthogonal groups in dimension seven and eight are not the spheres. They are spin groups. What happens is that the spin three-dimensional group is the spin degree three group is the same as the three-dimensional sphere. These are more complicated, but anyway, they can be described in terms of octonics. The fact that the <clears throat> set of unit length octonions form almost a group, not exactly a group because associativity fails, but this move and loops implies that the seven dimensional sphere is parallelizable and it gives a nice parallelization of these spheres. And actually, this is a topological result. Uh, the spheres that appear in complex numbers, inside complex numbers, is one, the unit circle, inside the Hamilton quaternions, the three-dimensional sphere, and the octonions, the seven-dimensional sphere, are the only parallelizable spheres. If we take also the six-dimensional sphere consistent of unit length imaginary octonions, well, this is endowed with an almost complex structure. And again, only the spheres inside the imaginary quaternions and imaginary octonions are the only ones that have these, these structures of almost complex structures. And they are inherited from the product in quaternions and octonions. Also, you have studied uh, projective geometry from a synthetic point of view, starting from the axioms. At certain point, uh, it turns out that if the dimension, you can define dimension at a certain point, is at least three, uh, you have uh, that uh, the projective space satisfies the disargesian property, but in dimension two, there are non disargesian projective planes. Well, the simpler example of non disargesian projective plane uh, is given by the octopus in terms of octopus. And well, here you have another property of nice spheres that are, can be described as homogeneous spaces in a non-classical way, so non not dealing with just orthogonal groups or unitary groups or symplectic groups, are uh, spheres that are related to octonions in, in a way. Okay. And uh, well, so I hope to have convinced you that these are uh, interesting mathematical objects and uh, beautiful mathematical objects. So let me finish with a sentence by a mathematical physicist, Susumu Okubo, who passed away a few years ago and who studied these uh, uh, octonion algebras and also some other composition algebras that we will talk about probably on Wednesday or on Thursday. Uh, but he studied octonion algebras and things related to octonion algebras. And well, you can read here the saying that God is the mathematician so that even with meager experimental support, a mathematically beautiful theory will ultimately have a greater chance of being correct, has been attributed to Dirac. Octonian algebra may surely be called a beautiful mathematical entity. It is possible that this and other non-associative algebras, other than Lie algebras, may play some essential future role in the ultimate theory yet to be discovered. So I hope to have convinced you that, yeah, octonions are a beautiful mathematical entity. Uh, thank you. Very much. Okay, let's thank the speaker. Um, thank you. Are there any questions, comments? Any questions? Well, in the in the first talk, there appeared the, the question of uh, what happens. The, the, the question that graves are. Uh, told Hamilton, if with your alchemy, you have been able to get three pounds of gold, why to stop there? 
And the question is that one has to stop there. Well, one can use the same process of doubling with the same formulas, but one loses the multiplicative property of the length. And this multiplicative property of the length is the crucial point to deal with isometries and to relate this algebra with geometry and other areas. So, yeah. There is, well, we'll talk about these things later on, tomorrow. Okay, any other questions? No, maybe um, I have a question. Uh, uh, yes, someone else? Um, Alberta, I, I, I would like to ask you about actonionic determinant. You have mentioned uh, uh, the norm a lot. Yes. So uh, it seems like, uh, at least from matrix point of matrix point of view, uh, that should be a constructive definition of determinant, uh, which could be of some use. Uh, yes, uh, this is very interesting. Actually, uh, well, uh, these next days I will be talking not only of the division algebra of quaternion uh, and but composition algebra in general. And uh, so uh, over any field, we have the quaternions and there are, depending on the field, the quaternions may be division algebra or split. Well, the algebra of split quaternions that exists over any field is just the algebra of two by two matrices. And the norm of the, of this quaternion algebra is, is precisely the determinant. So, uh, so actually uh, in two by two matrices, the determinant, the usual determinant of two by two matrices is the norm uh, of uh, the matrices when we think of matrices as split quaternions. So actually the norm of an octonion algebra is the determinant of this octonion algebra. Now, if we consider matrices over the octonions, not just one by one matrices, not just octonions by matrices over the octonions, then defining determinants is not that easy. But the norm of the octonions should be thought of as the determinant of the octonions. Thank you. Thank you. Very well. 